It's amazing to me that so many people say, you know, the business owner carries all the risk of the business. <laughs> Do you hear stuff like this, right? It's like, obviously, it's not just the business owner who carries risk. No, no, they they, they totally ignore that workers put their blood yeah. and their life. Yeah. Your entire life. Plus the loss of the families as well. You don't hear of too many owners dying on site. Right. So if they lose something, it's money. Yeah. Money is replaceable. But lives aren't. Hey, fellow workers. My name is Kim Seaver. Welcome back to the Alberta Worker Podcast. You are tuning in to episode eight of season three. We are part of the Labor Radio Network and the Harbinger Media Network, and we are broadcasting today from the territory of the Nisitapi. I am pleased to announce today's guest is Pierre, a retired CN worker. Welcome, Pierre. Thank you. Yeah, so we will just go ahead and get started. Uh, we'll just have you tell us your life story, where you grew up, what your family life was like, where you went to school, that sort of thing. And then your personal labor history, first job, subsequent jobs, what you're doing now, you know, the journey you took to get there. And you can either integrate those together or do them separately. But the floor is now yours. Thank you very much. So my name is uh, Pierre, and uh, I'm originally from Quebec. I come from a small town uh, named Lac Megantic. Everybody knows that town from the train explosion in 2013 now, but back then it was just a small, regular town, about 5,000 people. I grew up in a uh, good family. Uh, my father was a foreman at a uh, plywood fabrication company. I started my uh, working days, I could say, uh, at 15 years old. Back then, it was uh, you either go to school or you go to work. And so since I was skipping most of my days, my dad said, <laughs> well, you're going to work. <laughs> <laughs> so I ended up going to work uh, for, uh, for, well, at the time he was retired, so I worked for a different foreman. I worked there for about six months. That foreman that was there placed me in a position I had no clue. I was 15 years old. Somebody senior to me had been moved for me to get that job, and I didn't know. My job was so boring. All I had to do was to stamp plywood. I had four colors to follow. So I had blue, yellow, red, and green. And those would determine the quality of the plywood that would come up. Somebody right. else would determine what the quality was on the main floor. That plywood sheet would come up on the second floor. And all I had to do is match the colors. I didn't right. even know what I was doing or anything. So somebody replaced the stamps, like mixed the stamps around that were under the colors. Oh. So it took a few months, but then the quality of the wood that was coming back, uh, like, I mean, a company would buy premium quality wood and they would receive bad wood. So that all landed on my responsibility. So instead of getting fired, the foreman laid me off because my dad was a good friend of his. And looking back today, I think that that was one of the best things that happened to me in my working career. That kind of pushed me to get out of there and explore the world. Okay. I was 17, 16 at the time. And I came out West. Uh, I had some friend of my brother, my older brother that was living in Edmonton. So I decided to come out for adventure, looking for work and whatever. But when I got here, because I was 16, I wasn't allowed to work. I was a minor and my parent was not a citizen of Alberta, so we couldn't sign the permit. So that was my first summer in Alberta. And being stubborn, I didn't want to go back. So I stayed out here. I was broke all summer. I was looking for work, but nobody would hire me. So there was all kinds of adventures that happened that summer. <laughs> I learned a lot that summer. Like I said, I come from a good family. Uh, my mother was a stay-at-home mom. We were eight children all together. I was the last one of the family. Well, there was another one. Marie's Marie was born after me, but uh, she was disabled, and she was an institution uh, all of her life. Uh -huh. So anyway, so I was out here, and I went and tried to do the cherries in Kelowna. That lasted half a day. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, came back to Edmonton with my friend here, was staying here. And they were all working on the railway, by the way. They were all uh, working for CP and CN. Okay. Then I went back to Grand Prairie with a couple of friends of mine that came from uh, Megantic. And they came up. We hitchhiked to Grand Prairie. Couldn't find any work there. Continued on to Vancouver, sleeping on park bench, eating at kitchen soup places, uh, sleeping at homeless uh, shelters. So I've seen a lot of stuff that goes on in the shelter. The little that I know that, you know, we were only allowed to stay there for three nights. Oh. Third to third night, they would kick you out. Oh, really? Then that was in uh, Kelowna. Yeah. In uh, Vancouver, <laughs> 
I tried to uh, to get some welfare, but uh, I was underage, so I screwed up my date of birth or whatever, and so obviously I wasn't allowed. So that was the end of the summer. That was in uh, in September, October, and so they said, okay, well. You know, we'll give you two weeks of meal tickets and a place to stay. To stay. After that, if you can't find work or anything, then we'll ship you back home. So that's what we did. Mm -hmm. Stayed there for two weeks, couldn't find any work. So they sent me home on the train with no sleep berth, just sleeping in the with the luggage. Uh, was oh. <laughs> where I slept. It's three nights and four days uh, to get to Montreal. My two friends that were with me decided to stay instead, and they sold their tickets, and they went and tried to get some uh, magic mushroom on the island instead of going back. <laughs> But I had enough of the cold weather, and I had enough of sleeping outside. I mean, at one time in Kelowna, I even begged the police to take me in because it was raining. Because I didn't commit a crime, they couldn't take me in. Right. So I ended up sleeping in a tunnel. I don't know if you know Kelowna much, but in the park there, there's a tunnel that goes under the road where the bombs sleep. And so I slept there for a couple of nights, a knife in hand and uh, my backpack beside me because you don't know what could happen, right? Sure. So anyways, I went back to uh, Quebec, to my hometown, and then I decided to go back to school because I, I hadn't finished my grade 12, right? So I went back to school in a welding class. Okay. It was a program that was offered by the federal government through uh, EI. Uh, the one wise thing that I did is when I left, I discontinued my EI. So I still had some EI to rely on when I went back. So I had five months of EI left. The course was six months. So they taught me up to six months. I went to live with one of my brother in Granby. That's where the courses was going on. So I took that welding class. That was in the beginning of the 1980s. So the recession was really bad at the time. Uh, there was no work. People with 20, 30 years experience uh, in the, the welding field would be getting laid off. Uh -huh. So as a, as a new ticketed person, there's no way that I could find any work down there. I knew sure. there was work here. I was just under age when I came the first time. So by the time all this happened, I had turned 18. I decided to come back to Edmonton to find work, but also again for uh, excitement. Right? So I came to Edmonton. Then I went and got hired for a welding company. And uh, I didn't know the language at all. I was uh, completely French. Like I barely understood English. So a funny thing that happened is I worked there for probably a couple of months, I think a month or two months. I screwed up on my cuts on the weld. Uh, I was supposed to cut some big circles with a torch. The person that owns the place told me what I had to do and then left me there to finish the job. So I, I finished the job. Okay. Then the next day I come to work and I thought he was a bit excited. But the thing is, in Quebec, the two last week or two first week of July, All the construction shuts down. Right. So he tells me to go home. So I'm thinking, I'm on vacation. Because <laughs> uh, <laughs> it happened to be the same two weeks. So I go back and uh, we were about, I don't know, six, seven guys living in a house. So the guys were telling me, like, CN is hiring right now. You should go and apply there. And, oh, no, no. I still have a job. Like, I, I'm on vacation right now. <laughs> were you living with coworkers? Okay. No, no, no. Okay. So I went back after my two weeks thinking that uh, I'm going back to my job. I didn't get a good reception there. <laughs> I don't think that I did, but I must have cost them a lot of money. <laughs> so then I found out that I, did, I didn't have a job no more. So then I came back uh, to the house and then I went and applied for CN. And then uh, my adventure with CN started. Oh, wow. Started there. I was 18. Never worked as a welder. It's something that I took to get in. But, it, you know, like even the instructor was telling us, it's not something you want to do forever because of the bad stuff that you breathe in right oh uh -huh. okay so anyways so i was interested but not so much so i went and worked with cn as a laborer so my first job was uh in bodo saskatchewan they gave me a train ticket and uh sent me over there and then i started with a uh, tie gang we were replacing ties i was a laborer for uh with cn for Four years. And again, like, you know, I didn't understand the language. So there was some bidding position that would come up, but I wouldn't bid them because uh, I didn't understand how the system worked. Right. So it took a while before I caught on. Then I started looking at equipment. I mean, when you're a laborer and you're in the weather and you see the equipment operator sitting in a cab, nice warm cab, it's like, that's, that's where I want to be. <laughs> <laughs> The light went on, right? I got my first position in 1985. That was like one of the bottom piece of equipment you didn't have a cab or anything it was just a group three so you're basically a laborer but it's more like you're running a quick cut which is similar to a chainsaw but you're cutting the rail okay. drilling the holes to make the joints 
And from there, I went to uh, group two. Like there's four classification. There's the group three, group two, group one, and group one special. And the group three is the lowest classification. Group one special is like cranes and uh, the, all the bigger equipment. Okay. In 86, I believe, I got my first position as a group two that was operating little tie crane, a small crane that maneuvered ties and stuff to insert them under the track when you replace the ties. And so for those who don't know, the ties are the piece of wood that you put between under the rails. Right. When they get rotten, yeah, they have to be replaced. So uh, that's what I did for quite a while. Throughout all that period of time, I was getting laid off in the winter. So this was more of a come out here in the summer, make some money, go back home. And then stay there uh, out east at Migatsik for uh, two or three months out of the year. In the spring, I would come back here and go back to work with CN. So I did that every year until uh, 86, I think I started permanently. And what did you do when you went back home for the winter? I just enjoyed my time. Oh, okay. <laughs> you know, when I was out here in the summer, those gangs, they were running uh, 17 days and four days off. Oh, wow. That meant that uh, you would get like four days off throughout a month and we were in the middle of nowhere when we were working right it was hard work and so it was nice to have the time off in the winter i would go on the on the eye on pogi in the winter okay in the spring i would return here but then uh i wasn't having fun much anymore so i, I was thinking okay well now it's time for a change i was thinking of going back home and then i met my wife and then so we fell in love and uh, actually uh, yesterday uh, was the 37 year of our first date oh that's awesome. My spouse and I will hit 30 years for our first date next year. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. Congrats. So yeah, I met my wife. So that kind of changed. The... <laughs> I had some drastic changes in my life after that. Matured pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Things got serious. And, uh, and my wife was from Edmonton. I wouldn't have expected her to move out east because... I come from a French background and, uh, you know, so it's me that's over here. So I didn't want her to move. And you understand what it's like to be immersed in another language. Oh, absolutely. I have some horror uh, stories, you know, when you're young and you go to a party and you don't speak the language, people look at you like, and you feel dumb. You feel like you cannot participate in any conversation, you know? Totally. Girls come to you and talk to you. They get no response or they get so it's like, you know, you brushed off the side pretty quick. And so that was pretty hurtful. Uh, that was one of the hardest things that I had to do, I think, uh, well, besides leaving my family. But when my wife met me, I, I was pretty well bilingual by then. <laughs> right. So anyway, so we, we got together. Then I started working on a permanent basis with CN. I wanted to make more money to get established. And CN that was, that was a good company to work for because, well, first of all, we had a pension. We had a union. We were unionized. Talking about the union, in 1982, I was fired for, uh, we were sitting down. It was like July in Belmont, working in Belmont. It was really warm. And so we sat down to drink some water because we were pounding in anchors, which is really hard work in the sun. Sure. So we came home that night and then saw a couple of guys that come with me from, from my hometown to find some work here. We were all in the same gang. Foreman shows up that night and he says, uh, you four French guys, you come with me. So I thought, oh, we're going to work overtime, right? So I'd already worked a year with CN by then at one season. So that's normally what would happen. It would grab you and then you go do some overtime. You go work some overtime. All right. And to my surprise, uh, he tells us that we're fired. Whoa. For having a water break? Yeah, we were having a water break. And, and at CN, uh, in the collective agreement, there is no time breaks because uh, during the day, you'll have the train going by and stuff. So while the trains are going, then you get some time off. So you get usually get plenty of time off. Okay. But this was a different story because this was a new track. So there was no train on that track. Right. So anyways, my, my three other friends went back home, but I, I stubborn like I am. I said, no, I'm staying here. Uh, my English was really poor at the time. And I went to the office and all I could say is, uh, I want the union. Uh, you know, I knew we were unionized, so I wanted to talk to the union. You knew the English word for union. Yeah, union phone number, union phone number. <laughs> and this lady that I had bugged, I don't know how many times, finally gave me a phone number. And so I phoned uh, the union and uh, two weeks later, they hired me back Nice. with full pay. They asked me where I wanted to go. And I said, I want to go back there. Oh. And that same gang with that same foreman, just to show him that you can't treat people that way. This is not <laughs> 1950 anymore, right? He was an old Portuguese guy. So he was the boss on that gang and nobody 
said no to him, right? So anyway, so I got there, and in the morning, to his surprise, I was making my lunch for the day, and he goes, uh, what you do here? I work here. I said, no, no, you no work for me. You don't work for me no more. Well, yeah, I work for you. So anyway, we had that argument, and then finally the supervisor showed up, took me to his office. He sent me to another gang that was right next to there, so I thought, okay, whatever. I'll just right. go back to work there. Yeah. My first day on that new gang, we were dumping ballast, and dumping ballast is a bunch of cars knuckled up together and they're filled with gravel the gravel that you have on the on the track there's doors at the bottom of these cars you have to dump the ballast because the way that they they level out the track is they'll have a machine that comes behind and lifts the track outside of the gravel and then levels it out that way and then tamps underneath the, the, the ties and so it makes it level so in order to get there you need to dump some ballast on top of the track that's what I was doing, but I had never done that before. And I told the foreman, I've never done that before. Oh, I show you. And this guy was Italian. No, 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 I show <laughs> you. No worries. I show you. So he would lift his arms up for me to open the doors. And then, you know, he would bring his arms down to tell me to close the doors because there was too much ballast being dumped. If you dump too much, you, you can have huge trouble. Those doors, you could control them, but there's another type of door that you can't control. Once it's open, you can't close it again. Oh. I started opening a door. I opened it too much and he got excited. And so I thought he wanted me to open it more. So, oh no. <laughs> so I just opened the thing right up. <laughs> there was two locomotives pushing the ballast cars. They're not supposed to do that. They're supposed to be pulling. And the reason, you're gonna find out the reason why they're not supposed to do this. Now I had dumped so much ballast that they had to try to disconnect the cars or push through. So they figured it would push through. They derailed the front end of the locomotive. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> so I can say that my first day back from being fired, I derailed one of their locomotives. <laughs> no one's gonna fire me again. That's right. <laughs> so so uh, I had to go under and, and shovel that gravel out of there under the, the locomotive. So it wasn't very popular there. <laughs> yeah, no doubt. <laughs> So anyway, so I, that was in 1982. Then I, I became a Thai, working on Thai gangs and stuff. And then when I met my wife, I was trying to get something closer to home, right? And that's the nice thing with CN is there's so many openings and there's bid positions that come up sure. because it's unionized. And then you can post on those positions and then they'll train you. And then, you know, you, you get paid to get trained and all that. And it turns out that uh, I got most of my training through CN. To make a long story short, I ended up being a crane operator, which is the Group 1 Special. That's how I ended my career at CN. Oh. So yeah, so they trained me for all that, all the equipment. I was qualified on like 23 pieces of equipment by the time I was done with the track. Oh, wow. Yeah, so, and I gained a lot of experience because I saw production gangs. I worked on production gangs. So I saw welding crews. I worked with welding crews as a laborer. When I was an equipment operator, I was a temporary operator. So I would jump from, from crew to crew. So sometimes I would work with track maintenance crew. Sometimes I would work with uh, bridges, all different crews like that. So I was known across the region quite a bit. I was a good operator and I could make things happen. By then, me and my wife had gotten married and got married in 1987, 87 or 88. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully doesn't listen to this. <laughs> that was seven years before us. We got married in uh, 95. All right. All right. So uh, we purchased our first house in 88, I believe, 88, 89. So I wanted something more stable. So I started getting positions on uh, maintenance crews. I lived in Edmonton at the time. So Wabaman, which was like 40 minutes away from home. I worked there for a couple of years. And then there was a, uh, another a recession. So there was a bunch of people got laid off and stuff. So I ended up getting bumped a few times. So I ended up having to go back on the gangs for a little while. And in the meantime, my first son was born in 1992, Stefan, when I was in Wabaman. So that was really hard because I had to leave. Uh, like I was working on the on the picker truck in Wabaman in 92. In 94, 95, I had to go on the road again. But then it wasn't uh, 17 days and four days off. It was 10 days on and four days off. So you could have a better life, a uh, right. better family life. Yeah. It wasn't the best, but you could you have some some determined 
uh, days off. So that lasted for a while. And then after that, uh, in the collective agreement, we have a uh, job protection, which is a uh, senior major and you must. Because this is seasonal work that we do, the maintenance work would go all year round, but the production work would start in the spring. People with seniority, you had to fulfill your obligation to your seniority. So if you if, you, if the company would call you out to go to your first job, you couldn't refuse. If you refused, you lost your seniority in that classification. Right. All the senior guys would end up in Vancouver away from home because those were the jobs that were available. Vancouver, Kamloops, because that's where the weather turns better every year in the spring. Sure. So in order to alleviate that, what the union did, they had an agreement with the company where they called it the senior major and you must. Uh, what what the, the agreement was, was that uh, if uh, an individual is called out, that there's a junior person that is qualified for the work, the senior may refuse and the junior person must accept that position. So it would trickle down to whoever wants to go down there. So like this, a senior employee could have the choice whether to go there or to stay here. Because by the time the bulletins would come out, if you would start over there before the senior major and West agreement was in, you would end up being there until July or August by the time you were able to bid yourself back up here because by the time the positions open up, bulletin closes, the assignments was done, it took a long time. Right. So by doing that, a person could hold back here and then wait until a job comes open close to his home. And then when he was called for that position, then he could go to that position, less traveling for the person that was a senior. And so I used that quite a bit to stay around home. Then I started working just out at St. Gudo, which is about an hour away from here. And that's when I started on the cranes. I started as a helper on the cranes on the bridge in St. Gudo. So I worked on there uh, in the winter while the production gangs were shut down. And then in the spring, I would go back out and that lasted for a few years. And another thing that would happen too is because you make more money on the gangs than you would on the on the maintenance crews. So some guys from the, the maintenance crews would bid out to those positions so that would open the section, the, the, the maintenance uh, positions. So what I would do is I would backfill those positions rather than to go on production gang so that I could stay closer to my family. Permanent positions were available, but because the company could do a shakedown every six months, and at the time, the, the, the economy wasn't doing well, oftentimes people would move their house and everything to a, to a position somewhere. Six months later, there we go, they had to move again and they had to move their entire family. So instead of doing that, I chose to stay temporary so that I'd be doing the traveling. And if I go to work somewhere else, well, then I don't have to move my entire family so my family can have a, a stable life. Like my kids can stay in their school, my wife can stay here, and I'll do the traveling. Right. And you'd be gone for only a few weeks or something, right? I'd be gone for 10 days at a time. Oh, okay. And then back for four days. Right. Sometimes eight days, back for six days, oh, okay. uh, depending on the cycle. And then oftentimes I would end up like in Hinton or... Intern was pretty much the furthest that I, would, that I would end up. So it worked out really good for me. Yeah, that's not too bad. Yeah. So that's that's what I did. So I, I did that for a while. When the senior major bus was there, like I was a group one at the time. If a group one position would come open, because I didn't have to fulfill my highest classification, I could opt to go to a lower classification, which was a group two. Because I had more seniority as a group two, I could hold something pretty good here around Edmonton. So I would opt to stay as a group two but I would never lose my seniority as a group one until I become the junior group one. Then I would have to fulfill whatever position there was there. So there was a uh, crane position on the bridge. By then I was qualified, fully qualified on the, on the cranes. And I was working here around cameras. I think I was, or something like that. So I got the call that uh, I was the junior guy and I had to go fulfill a position in Prince George. Yeah, that was not a good feeling. Yeah, so I ended up forced to be out in Prince George. So I went there for a bit. So being a crane operator, there's a lot of technicalities and stuff. And their cranes are not the best cranes. And the supervisor uh -huh. sent me out there. And uh, so I had to prepare the crane to go out. It's a, it's a rough terrain crane. It's 40 ton. And so I checked all the cables. There was things that needed to be replaced, that needed to be fixed at the shop in Prince George. And then I was going to uh, Puskupi, just outside of uh, Grand Prairie, Lawson Creek, I think. Okay. And so I hadn't seen the bridge yet. I didn't know what I had to do, but I got the, the crane ready. That took a week. So I got myself to Puskupi, looked at the bridge. Then I found out I, I couldn't, like looking at the charts, looking at the bridge, I couldn't even do the, the work that they sent me there. Oh. 
And it's a good thing that I was a senior guy and understood how cranes work because somebody could have could have died. But like, I mean, that bridge was really old. Uh, the ties were smaller, so I couldn't go on rubber because on rubber, you get more capacity than you would on, on wheels. So they thought that I could just put the crane on rubber. And according to the charts, I couldn't. And then it was a high bridge and it was to replace a, a sill at the bottom of the bridge, which is a, an A-frame, so it's further out and it's in a curve. It was obvious that I couldn't use that crane to do that work. Now, if a young guy would have gone there, and I explained that to the supervisor at the time, like, you know, because there was a lot, like, I get there, the crew is there, everybody's ready to work, now they have no crane. So who gets the pressure? That was me. My ass is on the seat and we're working on a bridge. So uh, if I go over, it's uh, you, there's no coming back. That's why it's very important that you know what you're doing. And so I had this argument with the supervisor and uh, he ended up coming over and looking at the charts and looking at everything and then came to the conclusion that I was right. So luckily now that position was not open anymore. So I went back to Edmonton on my, on my group two equipment in Camrose. I went back there and then they had another position again in Prince George. So they sent me back in Prince George on that position. I had been very uh, heavily involved with the union since uh, 1996. I started getting involved with the union as a uh, president of the lodge here in Edmonton. There was 200 members out of Edmonton. Okay. And that was steel workers? Uh, no, no. At the time, we were the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way employee, oh, okay. the BMWE. All right. And at the time, we were with CN and CP for uh, maintenance of way. And the reason that I got involved pretty heavy with the union is that a, a, a co-worker of mine who was working on a bridge in Terrace, BC. That was in 1994 or 95. His name was uh, Bill Carson. He lost his life while a bridge collapsed under him while he was working. Oh, wow. We always did the work with our own people with CN. And now CN started to contract out the work. Contractors come in. They need to meet their bottom line. They started dismantling the bridge because we have to do our work on the bridge while the trains are, are going by. So you can dismantle some of the bridge. You leave some parts on, obviously. And then once you get a, a chance to go to work, you can shut down the track, do what you need to do. And if the more parts that you have taken off the bridge, well, the faster that goes when, when the time comes that you can get that, that window of opportunity, right? Sure. So yeah, so they dismantled too many braces and the bridge collapsed. Oh my goodness. The crane ended up in, in the slough. And uh, yeah, so uh, Bill died. He was 36 years old. Oh my goodness. I'm sorry. That's all right. He left uh, three kids behind wow. and a wife. I had ran into him uh, about a week prior to this happening, and he was all excited to go there because there was going to be good money and, and all yeah. that. And so it was really uh, it was a sad thing. It's like these workers in, in Maryland who were working on that bridge that the barge ran into. You know, that yep. type of a job, you don't expect to not come home from work, right? You think this is a yep. pretty safe job to be in, but then stuff like this happens. Yeah, and uh, the, the worst thing is that there was a crew on that bridge when the bridge collapsed. Uh, the crane wasn't the only one on there. Like, the, the bill passed away, but there was three deaths on that bridge. Wow. There was uh, 25, 26 people, because when you go on the bridge, you have to be tied up. So they, they put you with a, you have a harness. In case you fall. Well, that harness is tied on to the rail. Right. So when the bridge fall, you go with the bridge. Yeah, yeah. So there was a lot of injuries. Scott wow. Steele was the contracting company up there. So they had one worker. I had another friend of mine that was uh, the helper on that crane that, thank God, had to go get some supply that day so he couldn't do his job. So a worker from Scott Steele replaced him. And uh, this, unfortunately, this person passed away as well. Yeah. So then the company had the gall to argue that he, Bill was not working for them at the time. He was working for a contractor because the contractor was in charge of the of the site. CN was claiming this? Yes. They really? went to court and they were claiming. I mean, this man had worked for them for over 20 years, died on their watch, and they had the gall to say. Try to weasel out of paying anything to his family by saying that he wasn't working for them. That's ridiculous. As it turned out, the judge uh, ruled uh, against them. 
and said, no, this man has received a paycheck from CN for the last blah, 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 blah. So he was, in fact, a CN worker. Good. At the time, and I think it's still like this, I'm not sure anymore, but in the cattle labor code, the maximum that a company could be charged for failing to provide the necessary precaution to their workers, the necessary safety precaution to their workers, was $25,000. So the judge issued the maximum sentence to see at $25,000 for a multi-million dollar company at the time. It's a slap on the wrist. No doubt. And that's when it really aggravated me that they're, they're, the laws are so wrong. Like, you know, I, I wanted to do my part to try to do something to change this, right? Yeah. And was his wife a stay-at-home mom? They were divorced at the time. Okay. And uh, so I'm not sure. But she was probably depending on his alimony payments and child support. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, she, they had three kids together, right? $25,000 isn't even enough for one year. Nope. So then uh, they had to sue under uh, the, the WCB Act. And that's where they got more money. I I have no idea how much they got through there. Okay. But uh, it's just so sad. Yeah company like that can get away with so little to have to pay for a person that sacrificed their life on their watch right yeah absolutely so yeah so uh yeah that was a, that was a, a big thing that that made me uh getting involved more get involved more in, in health and safety get involved with the union and then as a union rep started to file grievances i started to know how the system worked and all that our collective agreement is pretty complicated there was six uh supplements attached to the main agreement i've been retired for eight years now and i've been away from the book for three years prior to that so it's all together 11 years so i don't remember everything as i did at the time yeah there was a supplemental for the bridge there was supplemental for the electricians. There was a supplemental for, you know, all of the different classification had their own side agreement, if you will. Right. All attached to the main agreement. Sure. And the book was like this thick, like, <laughs> you know, just to give you an idea, when the Brotherhood of Maintenance of Way went and tried to merge, because we had lost, like CN had laid off about 50% of their employees. So, of course, the union had lost over 50% of their revenues. So then we ended up having to start looking for a merger somewhere. And the first one uh, that we were looking at was the Boilermaker. Okay. Then I started getting involved with that, canvassing for the union, uh, going around and uh, try to get the merger going with the brother, with the Boilermaker. That was a failed attempt. That was in the early 2000s. I think it was for a period of time. So I was working with the Boilermaker, you know, trying to sell the union. But we had a second attempt. Uh, this time was with uh, Teamsters. Right. And then the United Steel Workers got involved. Then cards started being signed uh, between 2003, I think, on the in the field. It ended up that there was a battle between Teamsters and Steel Workers, and I was canvassing for both at a different period of time. Oh wow. It ended up that the steel workers won. It went through a certification rather than a merger, which was very detrimental to the membership. Um, People didn't really realize what was the difference yeah. as much as we tried to explain it to them. Like through a merger agreement, you have an actual agreement. Right. But a, a certification is you're basically swallowed into the other union and you're going to get what they're giving you. Yeah. So there's no negotiation. But by the time we had done the negotiation with the Boilermaker and Dan Teamsters and uh, the steelworkers started signing up people, the uh, steelworkers won the certification by 11 votes. Really? Recounted three times. And how many people participated? 92% of the membership participated in the vote. So it was a really good turnout. Wow. Every time I was canvassing, I was going there for Teamsters, but I was telling the guys, like, look, I don't care who you choose to go with. I'm here as your union rep. I'm not here uh, for Teamsters or for steelworkers. I think that we would get a better crack at it with, the, with Teamsters, but it's your decision in the end. And then I would explain to them the similarities between the two unions, the BMW and the Teamsters and, and things like that, right? The, the benefits that you would get through them. So I was canvassing for Teamsters at the time, and I ended up uh, losing the certification. So I stayed as a president, the, the unit. I lost the certification, but I still maintained the respect for my membership because I was telling them, like, I'm your rep, so I'm going to be here. Whatever union we go with, I'm always willing to represent you. 
as long as you want me here, I'll be here. Because I, I gained a lot of trust at the time as well from the from the people around me. Yeah. So anyways, steel workers took over. Somebody else got elected in the full-time position for the mountain region. I continued on as the president of the local, of the unit. Now it became a unit. Before it was a local, but it's, it, now it became a unit. So the unit was 200 members or whatever. That's a voluntary position. Okay. Something went wrong with the other person that was permanent, and he resigned the position. And I got a call. And that was at the same time that I was supposed to go to Prince George the next day on a crane. I got a call and he said, oh, you're going to stay here and you're going to be the, that was just, John Dinnery was the president of the local then. Because the local now became the entire national, like across Canada. Oh, okay. What used to be called local was like, let's say you had a local in Edmonton, you had a local in Camrose, another one in Kamloops, another one. Well, those local now were called units. Right. And the actual local was the entire system okay from coast to coast so within that system there are five different seniority territory which is a uh, mountain region western canada prairie region which is manitoba saskatchewan and uh, you had uh, the greater toronto terminal anyways that's in ontario and then you had the uh, quebec and then you had the uh, new brunswick so uh, those were five different seniority territories so you couldn't work from one territory to another they had to keep you within the same the, the seniority territory so I was promoted to being the, the general chairman. At the time, was a regional vice president. Nice. But we had five vice presidents. So we had to change that title somehow because that didn't work out. Yeah. Yeah. So then I became the regional chief steward for the mountain region. That's the largest region in the local. Oh, okay. The steel workers have an awesome education program. And I've always been willing to learn. I always wanted to learn more. I, it's, it's my nature. I, I like to, to learn stuff, mostly when it comes to labor laws and collective agreements and, and stuff like that. So I got all my training through the steel workers, which was offered to all of the membership. Like I remember I used to put out uh, memos saying, okay, we have a course going on here. We would pay their replacement wages for them to go to those courses. So I got all kinds of training through CN, through them. The Labor Canada Code offered by uh, the Canadian Labor Congress. They had that as well. Grievance procedure, WCB advocacy. So you name it, I had the training. Like I went four-year leadership program out of Pittsburgh. So I did that for uh, two terms, I think. And then uh, the second term, because the, there was one vice president that was not a paid position and that was not a full-time position. The vice president had resigned. So it was up for grabs. So I was assigned to that position as well as their mountain region. And I got that position for about a year, I think. And then when the election came, somebody else did that position. Okay. And I was elected by acclamation, I think, that year with the steel workers. So things were going well. When I was a vice president, because I'm French, I'm bilingual now, fully bilingual. I used to go out to Montreal, and I was I also was uh, well versed in uh, arbitration. Part of my duties as a re regional chief steward was to uh, we had a, a committee, and then before we would bring a case to arbitration, we would do our homework and you know, figure out is this a good case? Uh, is it a losing case? You, know, you don't want to spend money and and time on in a case that has no merit. You know, before you go to arbitration, we had three-step process collective agreement for the grievance procedure. The first step, we, we being with the, the local foreman or whoever, the lo local supervisor, foreman, and, and the employee trying to get a resolve there. If not, that would proceed to step two. Then when it would hit step two, then it would go to, uh, well, to my level. From step two to step three, then I would determine whether or not it would warrant to be brought up to step three. And at the step three, then we would have a joint conference with the company every two months, every three months or something, where we would look over all of these grievances that were left, try to get an agreement on it, a settlement. And if we weren't able to get a settlement, then the committee would get together and we would determine if it's a case that would warrant to take to arbitration. And then when a case was warranted to take to arbitration, I had somebody that was with me with, from the staff with steelworkers that guided me at first to uh, to bring cases to arbitration, how to craft a brief. Our railway system is different. It's not a full-blown arbitration. The way that it works is that it's all based on a written submission through the grievance procedure. Once you get to arbitration, either party can't introduce something that was not already disclosed through the grievance procedure. If that happened, then uh, you would call it out of order and uh, it would be thrown out. So everything is in writing. So it makes it a lot easier to get a quick settlement. Problem with full-blown arbitration is sometimes you'll, before you get 
in the ducket, it could take over a year before you can see your case on, on the ducket. And so, and when somebody sits outside, like uh, somebody that's been that that's been terminated uh, or discharged, you know, that's a long time to wait without uh, without revenues. And the railway had an, an overabundance of grievances that were outstanding that, that way. That's when the Canadian Rail of Arbitration (CROA) was created. So there was a, one or two arbitrators that would determine all the cases. You would present your case through a brief process. The company would have their brief. You'd have your brief. I would craft the brief. I did a couple in French, did a couple in English. Uh, not a couple. I did, I did quite a bit in English, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so I would be charged with taking those cases to arbitration and present them, which I, I love doing that. There's no better feeling, you know, because by the time you get to arbitration, You've been arguing points with the company and they're stubborn and they won't listen. And now you say, okay, well, you know, when you have a good case, we'll go see a third party. And, and to have the third party tell them that the union was right, that's the <laughs> best feeling ever. <laughs> Mostly a company like CN. Although the company was good to me. I mean, I can't deny that. Sure. You know, I mean, all the training I've got through them and all that. I've seen everything in this company from the labor level all the way to top management. When I was a VP, I was dealing with top management. Right. The, when I was a regional chief, I was also dealing with top management in the region. There are some good managers, but there are some that just, they didn't care about their employees. All they cared about was the profit and profit and profit at all costs. I had a few of those. The first one uh, that I won was uh, a drug case. We are held at a higher level than any other regular job, right? right. Because of the danger that is within our, our duties. Sure. The thing is that if someone would smoke a joint on a Saturday night at a party, well, that THC would stay in your bloodstream for at least 30 days. Oh, wow. Although the company didn't have the right to do random testing, if there was uh, an incident or an accident, it would give them the right to test to see if you were under the influence of, of drugs or alcohol or whatever. Okay. Well, when they would do that test, they would do a urine analysis, analysis test. Their urine analysis test is only conclusive in one area, which is to say that you had THC in your bloodstream, but it doesn't confirm that you were actually high at the time of the accident or the incident. So we had this case. I mean, before you find the case, there's all kinds of other cases that come and go because they're not, you need to have a, a clad iron case in order to bring it there so that you can win this, right? I had worked with the staff rep that was working with me at the time. This individual was flagging for contractors that were working. There was a contractor there with a picker truck on the main line, and he was offloading some equipment. This uh, CN individual, who ended up being fired, was taking the track protection for that truck to offload. But it was a restrictive area, so in order to offload, he had to take the piece of equipment and swing over the railway track, which was the main line down there. So the foreman had to take track protection in order to make sure that there's no train coming before he makes his move. Right. But contractors oftentimes don't, don't, you know, they understand that go, 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 go. You know, I got to get my job done and I, I don't see any trains, so they, they'll do their work. So the foreman is far away and he sees the truck doing the work without his authorization. So he just flew down there and started yelling at him, giving him heck, right? You know, don't do this. Like, you're going to get yourself in trouble. You're going to get yourself killed, blah, blah, blah. So there was a big argument between the two. As it turned out, the foreman that were, it was an employee of CN ended up being pulled out of service. Really? Nothing was done with the contractor. That, that was the way that I saw when I was uh, dealing with grievance procedure, dealing with discipline. Nothing ever happened to the contractor. It was always the CN worker that would eat it. Wow. Even though he was doing his job, defending his track area and trying to keep the guy from getting killed or killing somebody. And then obviously, because there was an incident, then they drug tested him. And he told him right off the bat, said, I'm going to test positive for THC. I just, I smoked a joint this weekend. And this was the Monday morning. And so they tested him and sure enough, it came back. Uh, they call it a non-negative when it comes back with a urine uh, analysis. So they fired him because it came back positive, not positive, non-negative. But that's not a conclusive test that determines that he was high at the time at work. Right. And the rule stipulates clearly that one cannot be at work under the influence. This is not conclusive. So we took that to arbitration and we won. Nice. Instead of taking a year to a year and a half, it took five months to bring that case to arbitration. Wow. And that was my first case, actually. I had a lot of help with my staff rep, but by that time, the staff rep was gone. So I ended up taking that case to arbitration. I was jumping for joy. Yeah, no doubt. <laughs> I had seen so many people getting fired over the same issue, right? Sure. This case, actually, it was a pivotal 
case law that affected the total of North America in the way that they were handling uh, drug testing. There was some other company before, like Esso Canada. There, there were some case laws around drug testing. And uh, there was a thing called uh, a saliva test, which was more accurate. And it would, could determine whether you were under under the influence within a three-hour window. The company never did that. It's a more expensive test. Right? After we brought that case in, then what the company would do, they would do a urine analysis test. Now, if that came back non-negative, then they would do a saliva test. And then the saliva test was conclusive or pretty close to be conclusive. It would be very hard to try to fight a, a saliva test. And actually, that's what they use nowadays for the police uh, department when uh, because now pot is legal to determine if somebody is under the influence because they have the same burden is they have to determine if someone is under the influence at the time that they're driving because THC stays in your bloodstream longer, right? Right. In your fat cell, I guess. Sir. So now the company was doing a urine analysis test and then afterwards they would do a saliva test, which would then conclude that the person was either on the influence during, during work or not. So that was a big change. Obviously, we don't want people that work under the influence. I've always said, if you work for transportation or safety critical or any kind of safety environment, you don't want to show up high. You don't want to be smoking pot, either if you do it on Saturday or on Sunday, because that's going to show later on if you have an accident or an incident or whatever. Yeah. Since I've gone, I have heard that what the company does now, they don't fire you, but they pull you out of service. And then you have to go get uh, in-depth tested to see if you have a dependency to see if you have any other kind of issues before you come back to work in the safety critical environment really and then you know you get 80 percent of your wages no overtime when you're on disability right yeah so it's a type of penalty that is not really deemed as a penalty they can go around and and, uh, and discipline people for uh, smoking a joint on saturday night what i found throughout my career is they use health and safety to take away your right to privacy as much as they can. That's the effect of giving up your right to health and safety, right? Sure. So yeah, so that was uh, pretty much it. Uh, I was um, elected three times, one by acclamation. Uh, I was unelected in 2015. Get this, I was elected by acclamation in 2012. And I was unelected through an election in 2015. So I was thrown out in 2015. Oh, really? The thing is that most of my supporters were retiring. And so they weren't voting anymore. And there was this was a new generation coming in. Right. And there was a young lad that was, he was really good. Like I was training him to be my replacement because I was intending to leave in sure. 2018. But he couldn't wait and he ran against me anyone. So congratulations. <laughs> You're getting out, old man. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's that's basically it. You know, you don't realize it, but boy, that period of time just went so fast. Yeah. Before I knew it, it's like, wow, retirement age already, you know? Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's something that I keep telling the, 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 the young generation, enjoy this time because it's it's it goes by so fast. It's just sure. unreal. Like you, you get a family and then, well, you know how that goes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And then you don't see the days, you don't see the weeks. So what I did is uh, 2015, when I lost the election, I was offered a permanent position with the steel workers overseeing the local that uh, like I would have been overseeing the person that took me out of my position. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Pretty much it, with the other ones, right? Yeah, yeah. But I would have had to move to Toronto. My family being here, my kids being here. I had yeah. three years left. So it's like, well, instead of going through all this, I'll just go down to the tools and then do my three years on the, in the field because my seniority had accumulated in the meantime, so I could hold right here in the city. Okay. So that's what I decided to do. So I went on the gravel truck in the city. Yeah. Stayed there for three years, and then I retired in uh, at 55 in 2018. Yeah, been six years already. It just goes by so fast. Yeah, no kidding. Because my union position gets 24-7, it's very demanding, and it was a passion, right? I did all kinds of training for, you know, to better be able to represent the membership, you know, knowing what I'm talking about when I go and argue with the company. You need a lot of training for that. Like, I had some university-level training courses for labor law, labor history, Canadian and United States. I was also an emergency response team on a voluntary basis with the international. I did that for three years, I think. 
Okay. When there's an accident, and I was responsible for District 3, portion of the United States and Canada. And so there's 12,000 members altogether in that portion with different locals, not just the railway. There was uh, mines in there, there was uh, wood in there and all kinds of stuff. So what the emergency response team would be is when uh, there's uh, an accident, when there's a fatality, be it with the mine, with the railway, with any uh, industry that we represent, we would be dispatched as soon as possible to that place because companies will try to hide responsibilities when an employee dies. They don't want to pay. So the fastest you can get there and try to get evidence for lawyers to be able to utilize, the better it is, right? A picture through whatever, whatever you can find. Right. But our main, our main concern was to care for the family, right? There was another difficult time. Sorry. So it, that didn't happen to me. We had training about this, how to handle, because it's very, very emotionally draining. Yeah. This guy that was with us was saying that there was a fire in an oil refinery in the States. Can't remember where now. He went there to help the family. So what we would do is we would go there and, you know, who's going to mow the lawn? Who's going to retrieve the boots and the, the clothing from that person from that from that place, right? right. The vehicle. Yeah. Uh, things like that, right? So this guy went to get the locker empty and bring the vehicle back to the guy's place, right? After he had passed. And is this little boy This little boy saw him show up. He's like five years old and he's all excited because he sees his, his dad's vehicle show up. But he had been told that his dad was gone, but now he thinks it's his dad coming home. So he's all excited and he's yelling, daddy, daddy. And this guy is there bringing back the lunch pail and stuff. So it's not his dad, right? So it was like a, a terrible thing that happened. So just, just to give you an idea what we go, we went through being part of that, that program, right? But it's all in helping the individual, the workers, uh, the families. And uh, that, that was a, it's a good program for that. It's a very good program. I think the steel workers are the only, it's the only union that offers that oh. uh, to his membership. Yeah. Okay. So I was dispatched to, I don't know if you remember in Prince George, there was an explosion in a sawmill. Yes. There was three individuals that were burnt. Right. I happened to be in Prince George at the time, and I was. We had just ratified a collective agreement, a tentative agreement. So I was going around presenting the agreement to the membership. The membership of this sawmill? No, no, the membership of the CN. Okay, okay. Because I was working with my regular job, like a. Local, but then when these when these issues would happen, then they would dispatch you, right? But there was nobody to replace me to do the work I was doing. Right. So I I wasn't able to go to the sawmill or to the area. But when I was done, uh, I had one meeting in Terrace, I think. And then as soon as I was done, I flew back to Edmonton. These two individuals were in the burn unit in the, at the University Hospital. Oh, okay. Yeah, I went to visit with them. And, uh, but by the time I got there, the, uh, their life was pretty much over. Oh, no. So I couldn't really go and investigate in Prince George at the sawmill, but we also have health, health and safety uh, representatives that were there. Those are full-time employees of, of uh, steel workers. So they were there and they, they, like, they're taking care of that as well, right? So uh, that was taken care of by somebody else. Yeah, I had uh, some, some discussion with uh, their families and guiding them on what they could get uh, for information, trying to help them as much as I could go through the legal stuff. And uh, so I stayed, uh, I stayed with them. I went there two days in a row. And then after that it was, I pretty much had done everything that I could do. Yeah. So, uh, and then they, they passed away a week after that. Oh, that's too bad. And uh, yeah, it was, it was horrible. It was just a very horrible sight for me. So imagine for the family, it was just devastating. It's amazing to me that so many people say, you know, the business owner, carries all the risk 
of a business. <laughs> And then you, you hear yeah. stuff like this, right? It's like, obviously, it's not just the business owner who carries risk. No, no, they, they, they totally ignore that workers put their blood yeah. and their life. Yeah. Their entire life. Plus the loss of the families as well. Yep. So, so if they lose something, the owner, I mean, you don't, you don't hear of too many owners dying uh, uh, on site. Right. Uh, uh, but if they lose something, it's money. Yeah. Money is replaceable, but lives aren't and uh or limbs or legs or whatever right i mean that uh, so true and that really aggravates me when i hear employers say things like that because it's like you know we're equal you may be the owner of the business but we're the one running your business and without good workers you can't run your business in a profitable manner you know don't give me this that you're above your workers you know right because you've risked your money yeah yeah it's nice you did your part we're doing our part and so treat us as equal better than than lower breed or whatever right right i know and something that that really aggravates me a lot you know you may think that it's not right but you have a policeman that gets killed on duty they play with guns that is a very potential thing that should happen versus somebody that works on the railway versus somebody that works on construction we don't play with guns we go to work we expect to come back our family expect to come back yeah When a worker die, you hear from it at the back of the newspaper. Yeah. A little bit here and there. When a policeman die, it's a, a huge procedure. They get a parade. They get a parade. They get what every worker should get. Right. Absolutely. You know, it's not that I'm jealous of what they get. I'm, uh, I'm upset that workers who don't even, are not even supposed to sacrifice their lives for their work, are not even acknowledged properly. Yeah. You know, some people look at this and they, you know, how dare you talk like that about a policeman, but it's like, again, it's not, I don't have anything against the policeman and I, they, they should get what they're getting. It's just that everybody else should get the same treatment. 165 workers died in Alberta last year as a result of the work that they were doing and like, nobody knows. Like no, nope. most people don't even know the number, let alone the names of the people who died. Exactly. When you go through the the, like a, a, you probably have a, a, attended some of these uh, ceremonies, you know, for on the twenty eighth of April, remember the, remembering the workers, and when you see all the names, it really hits home. Those were people. Yeah. They had families. Some of them had families. Some of them are eighteen years old. Yeah. Some of them weren't even of age. They weren't. They weren't even supposed to be at work working in, in an area like that, like, you know, that I had a nephew, but not a nephew, but a cousin of mine, her child was working in a company out East. It was running, he was operating a forklift, was not trained, was 14 years old, was not supposed to be running a forklift. Oh my goodness. And uh, the forklift canted over and he died. Oh my goodness. You know, so the family was all happy because he had gotten this job and it's a good job and all that. You know, people don't realize the danger that there are involved with these type of work, right? And employers are so irresponsible. They'll promote a 14-year-old to a forklift, which is equivalent to a crane. You need to have some proper training for that, right? So, uh, yeah, that was that was terrible. I'm not sure how that turned out in the end. I, I would imagine that... Uh, Somebody would have sued the employer, I would imagine. Hopefully. So anyway, so that's, yeah, that's about it. And then uh, now I've been retired. And, and you know, that was the best move I've ever made because uh, <laughs> I, I was, I was popping. I was, I was 300 pounds. Oh, wow. 296, 98, because it's a demanding work. It's an involving, an involving work. Your head is always running with that. They say, don't take your work home. Well. When you have a family on the line that you know was unjustly terminated, right? And it's your job to take it to arbitration. You have to think of every little details that could bring this guy back to work. 
so preparing the brief is it something that uh, you know you don't do that in two weeks like it, it takes a long time to get together to, to to bring together and stuff and you're involved you're always thinking you know like uh, all of a sudden in the evening I'd be oh I got to do this I got to put that in there right I would I would write it down your mind is always thinking about that you're on the road 24 7 you're in restaurants and hotels and uh it's uh, glamorous at first, but in the end, it's not so glamorous. I'll tell you, like, you get a few, a couple of months of that, and then it's like, you know, another hotel. You know, you 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 know, you live in in hotels too much. When uh, you go to the floor and the hotel room that you had the day before at a different city, <laughs> while they, and then you go back down and you say, this key's not working. <laughs> But you're at the room that you were the day before. Yeah. You know? It's a different hotel, different town. One time, I'll give you, I'll tell you this. I'm going to an arbitration case. Actually, that was my first arbitration case that I was telling you about, about the, the drug case. Right. It was a, uh, a unit uh, meeting. So the entire uh, country, all our unit chairs were in that meeting. And we do that every three years, right? So it was important for us to be there and stuff. So I, I went there for the week. So I had to fly from Winnipeg to Montreal to go and present a case in arbitration, that case, and then come back to Winnipeg the day after. So it was just an in and out thing. I forgot my pants in Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> so I show up there and I don't have my dress pants to go to arbitration. <laughs> Talk about panic. Like I, I realized that when I was there, when I was unloading my, my luggage at night. So now in the morning, the case was going to be heard at 11 o'clock, I think. So I had that little window to go find myself a pair of pants. Otherwise, I was going to end up with my jeans at the, at the arbitration. Yeah. Case. <laughs> and I always, you know, made it, you know, said, you know what? And to me, I don't, you know, you got to dress up, right? It's like going to court. Sure. I went across the street. I found a tailor. I, I bought a pair of pants. I won't tell you how much I paid for that pair of pants because <laughs> it's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> so the guy, of course, the guy was there, uh, the, the the person that was uh, term that was uh, discharged, and I met with him for breakfast that morning. But by then, I had uh, found my pants and all that, and, and you know, I I had it all settled. And I told him about that. I said, don't you feel confident? The guy that's presenting the case on your behalf forgot his pants. <laughs> he knew we worked hard and we did everything we could on there. right? So, And we won. I was ecstatic. But went back to Winnipeg and uh, on the road all the time. So I retired in 2018. And within three years after that, I thought, OK, well, looking at where, where my health was, uh, I had some heart issues. I'd have to have a procedure. Uh, ablation of the heart i did some affibrillation issues with my heart uh, probably 2014 somewhere around there it started okay and what it does is your heart start beating at uh, 150 160 it wouldn't stop wow. they had to give me a shock to get me out of it yeah like a heart shock just like when you have a heart attack and i'm diabetic i'm a type 2 insulin independent. So that weight is not good for me. High blood pressure and the whole thing, right? When I retired, I vowed to myself that I would be looking after myself now that I don't have to look after 12,000 people. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'm exaggerating. I wasn't taking care of 12,000 people, sure. but uh, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand what you mean. You're always thinking of somebody, of the other people, right? What they're going through. Like, sure. you see all kinds of things. Like, when you take cases to arbitration, if families are destroyed by Oxycontin, and that person works at CN and gets caught in the drug testing, and there's not much you can do. Now he's on heroin, and, you know, it takes a toll on you. So, anyways, in three years, I lost uh, 85 pounds, almost 90 pounds. Huh? Uh, I started a gym program. I started, uh, you know, eating better and stuff. Now it's been six years and I'm maintaining. I just lately have gained about 10 pounds more, but that was the right move that I did when I yeah. decided to retire. And it's easier on your joints and... Oh yeah, well, it's easier on everything. Yeah. Because now I'm lighter. I started playing pickleball. Oh. You know, and now I got all the time in the world, right? Sure. And I'm glad that I stayed with CN because the pension that I'm on is a CN pension. There's no right. pension from anybody else, right? To... Yeah. It's uh, and it's a good plan, and I'm very fortunate that we have that plan. So, anyways, that's about it. I think that's uh, right. cool. that's, that's pretty much all of it. That that was awesome. I'm it was a a great story, and you know, I just wanted to express my appreciation for all that you've done for all those workers over the years. Well, thank you very much.
at this point of the interview, I always ask my guests the same question. How has your intersections of marginalization ever influenced your experiences as a worker? And that could mean gender, ethnicity, orientation, economic class, maybe even language, that sort of thing. Just how you've navigated that in the workplace. Yeah, being French, uh, that was my only language when I started at CN. Uh, being French, I was always overlooked. Uh, I was looked upon as when I was a laborer, when I was an operator, as somebody that didn't matter much, I felt. When I wanted something, I had to fight more than anybody else because I had a language barrier. And I also have a learning disability, borderline ADHD. So I need all the concentration in order to write anything or, or so every three years, I believe it was, we had to go write an exam for the rules at CN. That's like okay. almost 700 rules. And you study for a bit and then you write the rules. And with the disability that I have, and I didn't realize that until later on because my kid ended up with the same disability yeah. and we had him tested and it came back that he was positive for this because he had issues at, at school with learning. Same thing that I had when I was his age. Yeah. So they came up with special area. Like he didn't have a time limit when they had an exam. They would put him in a room that was quiet so that he wasn't disturbed by anybody else. Well, I didn't have that when I was learning with CN. And so when they were doing the rules, people would finish and then they would start talking. And for me, and now that would throw me off. Like I knew the answer, but I had to reread the questions all the time. And it was just a so I was always the last one to get out of there. So it was it was harder for me, right? Yeah. At the end, though, once that I found out what it was, then I would advise the instructor before we start the class, make sure that people leave and that it's silence in the room, right? Okay. Another thing that helped me a lot is that I wasn't working in a group environment. When I was with the union, I was working out of my house which I had my own office in my house. So I was alone. So I could concentrate as much as I can. I could, right? That's how I managed to write briefs. That's how I managed to write my grievances. So coming from a, from a place like that, you know, where I didn't even finish my grade nine, and then all of a sudden being at a, a level where I write grievances to return, I'm very proud of that because, you know, that's something that I have achieved myself, right? I mean, uh, of course, with help of, from everybody else, from from the union, from the, all the training, but I'm the one that had the initiative to go and get the training. I'm the one that had the initiative to go and see a doctor to see what was wrong with me, <laughs> yeah. you know, because you, you realize that at some point, right? Like, you know, you're not learning like everybody else. Sure. And with all the training that I took, it, it, it dawned on me that, you know, that's, and uh, so it, it worked out really good for me so uh, so yeah the language and and that uh, disability was uh, was a hurdle for me when i was homeless uh, for uh, probably about four months five months when i was out here the first time right and i didn't speak the language so i really experienced what homelessness is although you can say that i i decided to do that my own right nevertheless it's something that i've experienced like uh, i remember vividly sleeping in one of those hostels and uh, hearing somebody having sex right next to me in the cot next to me. In the cot next to you? Yep. Oh, uh, wow. And I understand fully when parents say, I don't want to take my kids there because it's horrible in there. You have all kinds of people in there. And so I understand people would rather live in a tent where they can have their own privacy rather than to have to go and live in places like that, right? I mean, you would think that they would have security. They would. I don't know how it is today. I'm talking like, this was like the early 1980, uh, late, late 70, early yeah. 80, 1980, uh, 79, 80. Right. And so it's a long time ago, right? And then you, you could only stay there for three nights and then they would boot you out. It's not the best. Begging for money, you know, it's, it's no fun either. Every time that I see somebody begging, mostly young people, because they have a life in front of them, I pull out my wallet and, and my wife hates it because... You don't know what they're going to do with that. Well, you know what? It's not going to hurt me and it's going to help them. It's going to give them some some hope. My attitude is, you know, it doesn't matter to me what they use it for. So No, exactly. It's just sitting in my wallet anyhow. Yeah, exactly. I, I mean, if somebody gives me a gift, they don't follow up with me a year later and ask me what I did with my gift, right? They give it to me and now it's mine to do what I want with that gift. Yeah, and it and gives you hope. Yeah. It gives you hope. Uh, in humanity, it gives you hope in yourself. It gives you, it gives you a meal. It gives you whatever, sure. whatever it gives you. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, at the end of the day, it, 
you know, I might give you a bottle of wine. <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> but I don't really care, you know. Yeah. So, I, I mean, uh, it opened my eyes a lot to, uh, and then everything that I've learned too, from labor history, from uh, the enslaving of children uh, in England when they were uh, sweeping chimneys and stuff like that, like, you know, coal mine here, textile in, in Quebec, uh, in Eastern uh, countries. Something that I've learned that is very interesting throughout my all my my training is that when uh, you know they had they had slaves in the united states right picking up cotton and stuff like that right so they were on a farm those slaves were captive well when they expanded to north america it's kind of hard to tell somebody to go get you some fur in the middle of nowhere in the woods and come back uh you know you you they're not captive yeah you can't keep them captive so the only way to do that was to give them something for the fur that they would bring back so that's that's what gave birth to the master servant type of agreement that we have today mm-hmm. through uh, labor codes, right? In exchange for your work, you receive money, you receive a pay. Right. This is how simple that was. I mean, it makes me laugh when employers say that they can't pay more than fifteen dollars an hour for an employee in an economy like it is now. It makes me laugh or make me cry, depending one way what way you're looking at this. If they could, they would pay you nothing. Absolutely. You got to remember that. Like they're they're ruthless. If they could pay you zero, they'd pay you zero. Yeah. And they could care less if you're starving or whatever. Not all of them. There's some good ones, but the, you know, I find that the vast majority of them really don't care. They're only paying you fifteen dollars an hour because they have to. It's against the law if they don't. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's why minimum wage is so important. Minimum wage yeah. should be at, at least in Alberta twenty one, twenty two, at least. Completely agree. It would be very close to a, minute to, to a living wage if, if, if that, right? Yeah. 15 bucks an hour in this day and age, it's like, it's crazy how people think that you can live on that. And then the boot, most of those jobs are not full-time. They're not 40 hours a week. They're trying to give you as less hours as they can. Yeah. The type of economy that we have, you know, if we can talk about the economy a little bit, uh, that's, that's no surprise. I mean, that started in 1980 with the Thatcher and the Reagan and their trickle-down economy. Well, now we're raping what they sold. Yeah. Well, all this time, bashing on unions' head. Unions are the only body that can take money and rights away from employer. Uh, under the Canada Labor Code, it's Section 48 that gives you the right to remove your service, gives you the right to strike. Yeah. And there's a process that was invented. At the time, that process was invented because they had no choice. It was a war. They needed people to go to work. They needed to increase production. And at the same period of time, people were striking all over the place because unions were not recognized by the law. They would just stop working. That was the only way that they could do it. And there was no process to do that. So that would hurt production in a time when they needed to increase production, increase production to build armament. And so the government sat down and then they came, you know, with the process of, you know, you'll have a period of time where you have negotiation period. And then after that negotiation period, then you'll have a period of time where uh, you'll have the right to remove your services as an employee. That process works. Before that process, before Section 48, employers had all the rights. Employees had no rights whatsoever. They could throw you on the street any day. I come from Lake Megansic, which is just outside of Tetford Mine. Tetford Mine was a mine of uh, amiantos. Amiantos is, uh, you know, is deadly. It causes the disease, the lung disease. The town was owned by a New York company. And what they did is they would provide you with a house. But if you get sick or if you didn't pass the medical or if they didn't like you or your work, you would be thrown out on the street. Oh, my goodness. Because they owned the house. Yeah. They got unionized. I was in probably, uh, imagine the 50s or something. I mean, they were dying right, left and center. But people didn't want to lose their employment. So they would pay for doctors to falsify documents saying that they were fit for duty. Oh, my goodness. And these people were spitting blood. I've seen reenactment of this where what they did is they, I don't know, like, I mean, those is a fiber and it's an open pit mine. Is that asbestos? Asbestos. That's yeah. That's, okay. that's what it is. Sorry. And uh, it causes the disease. I mean, I think. Oh, okay. Okay. Asbestosis. I mean, oh, whatever. In French <laughs> it's amiant. So that's why it, it's confusing to me. Sure. But regardless that fiber you would pick that out of the rocks by hand really? and then put it in a in a bag. And then they had a big press that would compress that bag. 
and there wasn't an enclosed area. Oh, wow. So there was dust of asbestos all over the place. And when that press would come down, it would just spew out all this asbestos dust. My goodness. People were sick. You know? Yeah. When they were too sick to work, the doctor would say if they smoked, it was caused by cigarettes. It was caused by anything else but the asbestos. Uh, there was a, a big fight over that because imagine like the town. And it reminds me of what the oil industry is going through today. Like the town was divided on that because when the union decided to go on strike for that, it shut down the town. And right. some people you know, needed that revenue and they want that house and they want that. But now, who are you to come and tell me that we're going on strike? Police got involved. People got beaten up. Goodness. People got put in jail. It was just a horrible time, right? Wow. Labor struggle. To know now today what we know. I mean, back then, they wouldn't even acknowledge that asbestos is like amiantos uh, or whatever the disease that it causes in the lungs was caused by that. It took years before the uh, decades before they, they, they admitted that that's what it was. Right. And now you see very little asbestos anywhere it's the same process that's going on right now with the oil industry which is sad because you know i feel for those people like is their income is their way of living it's always been you know but i mean it, it's pushed to the limit where saying they hate alberta because we have oil and, and it's, that's not what it is it's uh it's just oil is bad for the environment and we need to change our ways because uh we're burning up and we're flooding so all right any final thoughts for our listeners in my life I experienced, you know, a lot of highs and a lot of lows. Yeah. I mean, at first I didn't realize that, but when you, as, as you get through them, you realize that most everything can be overcome. Uh, if you believe everything start with the belief that it can be achieved, the belief that you can get there for any young listener, don't despair. In the eighties, the recession was 10 times worse than what it is today. It, it seems like it's worse today because employers are not giving people what they deserve for a living. They took right. the disposable income away from them and keep it as profit. Yeah. And you see it clear as day when you look at Loblaw and you look at people living in tents. It's it's a homemade crisis. Yeah. I mean, we lived through in the early 80s. I remember my brother had a house at 21% interest on his house. Oh, wow. It went up to 21%. It's a lot. And then after that, it started going down. When I purchased my phone, my first house in 1989 or 88, it was 12 and a quarter percent. The good thing is when you buy at that higher rate is when the rate goes down, well, you get to pay more on your monthly, pay, monthly payment or shorten your amortization period. You know, you, you get to play with it and, and it, it helps you. Of right. course, it's no fun to go to go through it when it goes through. And, and, and the incomes is, is much lower than what it was back then. Yeah. You know, when you compare cost of living right yeah relatively speaking yeah 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 all right Th thank you for that if anybody's interested in following you do you have any public social media or website or anything people can check out no i don't have any website i don't have okay. uh, no I'm, I'm on facebook uh, pierre jacques on facebook all right a c q u e s Inst uh, uh, i'm on instagram i'm on uh I'm pretty much all the medias except okay. snapchat <laughs> sounds good and if people are interested in following the alberta worker you can find us on social media we're on facebook twitter and linkedin you can also find us at albertaworker.ca and while you're there you might as well sign up for our email newsletter which comes out uh every day once a week and once a month if you like this episode please uh, rate it and review it in your favorite podcast app if you want to support the alberta worker you can visit us at albertaworker.ca slash support the Alberta Worker and this podcast depend on the valuable contributions and support of listeners just like you. If you want to be a guest on The Alberta Worker, just email us at podcast at albertaworker.ca or send us a DM on one of our social media accounts. Thanks so much, Pierre, for joining us. Thanks to all the listeners for tuning in. And as always, solidarity.